everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, I want to carry on uh, reviewing this book here, Autism, today. Um, we're almost getting to the end now. Uh, yeah, um, before I before I begin, um, I just wanted to just say a little bit about what I've been doing lately. Um, I've been um, kind of getting rather, um, I don't know if obsessed is the word for it, um, probably not to the point of well, I guess I am a bit obsessed by it, but again, I tend to get obsessed by everything I get interested in, so... But I'm, I'm, I'm very interested at the moment in um, looking at vintage, retro <laughs> mug designs. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of someone called um, Martin Wiscombe. Um, I think it's ehcp.design or something like that, if you Google it. Um, but he, basically he does like really old, kind of like retro -y kind of vintage designs that you can get on mugs and things. Like often from the 1950s, you get mugs, because I'm really into mugs, I've got a bit of a mug fetish. I really like looking at mugs and collecting mugs. And um, I've already ordered for Christmas um, two mugs from a different company called um, Otter House um, Gift Company. And they do lots of different mugs and I've gone and got a hot, two hot chocolate mugs, which I really can't wait to get for Christmas. Because one's got this really pretty design of a little boy and a girl um, uh, making a, a snowman. Um, and it's just like a really beautiful winter scene and I just love mug art. Um, Got a bit of a thing about it i just love mugs and bowls so yeah i've been spending a lot of time like looking at different mugs and bowls online and it's kind of helping me a little bit well it's kind of escapism really but i just wanted to share that with you just in case any of you are interested in mugs and bowls and collecting things like that anyway so yeah so getting on to the review now <laughs> um with this book uh, autism uh so i'm um, carrying on for last time I, I finished off last time talking about um the social motivation hypothesis and I finished off with um, a quote from Anne Mehmet on, uh, social, on uh, autistic social communication. Um, and uh, there's a question now, um, which is an interesting one to consider. Um, the question is, are our social interactions um, in infancy a testing ground in which we hone our domain general skills? For example, attention and executive functions. So that would suggest that um, we learn uh, executive functions through uh, social interaction. And therefore, if you struggle with social interaction, that's again going to impact these other so-called domain, general, non-social skills that, say, we normally, if you're not autistic, learn via the social world but if you're cut off from the social world that can then have a knock-on effect on your other on the development of other skills so that's one possibility alternatively do these uh, domain general skills such as executive functioning come first and our social interactions then draw on these underlying processes i guess that's a bit like a chicken and egg question like what come first like it's very difficult to disentangle or to know um it for me i do sometimes wonder whether in some cases um, the social issues in autism might partly stem from more wider information processing difficulties because I do really struggle with uh, executive functioning and those sort of skills around organisation and things like that and I also really struggle with processing information that comes at me really quickly. Um, I struggle with taking in information and processing it. It involves a lot of headspace. And obviously, if you think about it, like social, for social, um, uh, social interaction uh, does involve a lot of very uh, uh, kind of fast moving uh, information. Uh, you know, when someone's talking, you have to process what they're saying in real time. Um, you, don't, you don't have a kind of the option of kind of putting them on pause or, um, you know, uh, rewinding them, uh, or reading what they've said again, as you can do in a book, and taking your time over it, it's done, it's very quick, and not only that, but they're sending out lots of other signals, you know, eyes and hands, and, and if you're um, with them, say, in, in real, if you're with them, say, actually physically with them, as opposed to, say, um, uh, I don't know, because there's different ways of being with someone. But say if you're actually physically with them, like in the same room with them, and, and your social interaction with them doesn't just involve sitting down and talking, which is hard enough, but then say you might have to get up, you might have to move, 
um, they might want to do something else, you're not sure where this sort of thing is heading because you can't really read it and you don't have the understanding and it's all really unpredictable and then you've got to like try and reciprocate and that's really difficult because you've got a mon one track mind and you're focused on just doing one thing. That involves a lot of these similar skills, that these executive functioning skills. Um, so yeah, so an interesting thing to ponder, maybe autism can in some cases, not in all cases because it's a, a, a really broad condition, but maybe in some cases actually a faulty executive functioning system could contribute to social issues um, and a theory of mind problems. But that's just one possibility. Um, the other possibility of course is that if you struggle with social interactions you're then not going to be able to develop those other executive functioning skills so well because you're not going to be learning from other people because you're not really attached to them. It, I mean, well, you're not really kind of, you're not drawing from the kind of wireless sort of, um, how can I say, that kind of connection with others. Uh, if you're kind of not, if you're not um, connected to other minds, as it were, you're, you're going to find it harder then to draw upon those minds to learn how to um, navigate your way around the world. But it's possible, of course, that both theories are correct. You know, it might be a kind of reinforcing thing, you know. So these domain general skills, um, this, this then leads on to another theory about autism, which is the cognitive interpretation theory of autism, which suggests that autism is actually an information processing um, difficulty, um, which then can impact both social and non-social skills. Um, so in a sense, obviously, autism is defined first and foremost as a social impairment, but that's because obviously the social uh, world is so pervasive. And then obviously, if, if you have such a pervasive um, information processing uh, difficulty that's going to affect everything, it's obviously going to affect the social world. And then that gets focused on because that's going to part of the, part, that, that's the most important what many people consider to be the most important thing, hence why autism is termed a social difficulty. But again, autism actually does not just affect social skills. Um, it, could, it can affect literally everything. Autism itself is pervasive. So, hence the fact where we could argue that autism is actually an information processing difficulty. It's, in a sense, the social difficulty is just the tip of the iceberg. That's the bit that people see and focus on the most, but there's so much more than just the social difficulties. And I, I actually do think this, this theory is, is very plausible to me. Um, one such theory is the weak central coherence theory. Uh, so central coherence is the ability to essentially um, uh, bring everything together into a bigger picture. You know, to so get things cohere, they stick together, as it were, um, into this bigger picture where you can then derive from that the overall meaning and yeah, drawing information together is what central coherence is. And then if you have weak central coherence, you're not going to be able to do that so well. It's not so much the case that you can't do it. Um, it's that it's, it's, you're not biased in that direction. You have a preferential um, bias towards details and seeing things less connected. And then obviously it takes a lot more effort then to bring that information together. Whereas someone who's got a strong central coherence will find it harder in the opposite direction to maybe pick apart the details. So that's just one theory and obviously being autistic does mean as a general rule that you're gonna fixate more on details. I do that and I think most autistics do it to different extents in different areas. It's kind of part of being autistic, you kind of get very intense, you tend to kind of fixate on particular things, sometimes not seeing a big picture so well. Um, it suggests also, you know, there's a better attention to a better attention to a memory for local details, um, and this then for some autistics can result in strengths in block design. However, this can't be for all autistics because block design was actually one of my extreme weaknesses. When I did the block design as a child, I only got a two, which basically is a very low score that puts me only on the first percentile, so extremely impaired. So that's interesting um, because that goes against the stereotype. That autistics have strengths in that, and I, and I think um, there is a higher, many autistics do have strengths in block design, but obviously autism isn't one condition, and we're all different, and um, so they are going to be outliers like me, who um, don't do well on, on areas that you might expect autistic people to do well in. The argument that autistics do well in block design is the argument there is that they're 
freed from uh, contextual constraints. So that it can really focus in on your kind of details. But I think for me, one of my issues is actually organising information. And sometimes I get so overwhelmed by the details that I cannot, uh, that I cannot kind of um, isolate them in a sense. Because... I get so overwhelmed by the details, and I have, uh, and, I, and I think for me, it might, it's an executive issue. I'm sure you know the issue with block design. Um, you know, I think uh, so. I think again, it depends on some. Some for some artists, it can have a strength in, in block design, but for others, their executive functioning problems maybe can mitigate against that, and you end up just getting overwhelmed by the details, not being able to, um, you know, make sense of them or bring them together. Uh, so attention to detail, things like that, it doesn't always result in these strengths, like in block design. It doesn't, in my, for example, I really struggle with block design, but I'm still, I am very, I am, a, I am, I do focus on details, but it doesn't, but it doesn't give me those strengths. Um, or at least not in that particular area. I mean, in some areas, I think it does give me some strengths, like with my synesthesia, which also is uh, quite a detailed way of thinking as well. And synesthetes also are known to be uh, very attentive to details. Um, so in some areas, like, and I do have a really good memory. So in some areas, I think it, it does lend me strength, but just not in block design. Probably because of the other executive functioning problems I have that mitigate against it. Um, <laughs> there's a question also is whether there's a question also as to whether superior local processing, as um, which is often seen in autism, and reduced global processing or the reduced ability to draw information together into a whole, um, whether this is distinct and somewhat independent in autism. Um, so I guess in other words, whether or not, um, you know, you could potentially, um, in other words, where I think it's what this means is that you might be have superior local processing but that doesn't necessarily imply uh, reduced global processing. Um, so maybe it's not always the case that an autistic um, always can't see the wood for the trees, as, as the saying goes. It's more that they tend to show a bias towards local processing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, by default, they again have reduced global processing as well. And also, presumably, you can have reduced global processing find it hard to see a bigger picture, <laughs> as I know historically I've struggled with, I've definitely struggled with that, but that doesn't necessarily follow from that, you're going to have a superior local processing, because they could be independent, so hence the fact that yes I do struggle with big picture thinking, but that doesn't mean for me that I excel at block design, um, so they can be mutually exclusive as it were, I think that's what it's getting at. Okay, so I'm going to move on to video number two now to carry on this review of uh, autism, so moving on to video number two now.